In today's training, I'm going to share with you a completely new gambit against 1d4 that I've actually played in some bullet games myself, and I think it's quite a fun way to play if you just want to you know, mess around, have some fun, maybe surprise the opponent. Now, to be fair, the Alban counter game with e5 is not a completely new gambit. You know, Adolf Alban was one of the great players of you know, the late 9th, early 20th century, and you know, he would play it with d4 and try to show, you know, that the extra space here and the possibility, let's say, to try and you know, get the pawn back and play aggressively will compensate for the pawn. But modern engines have shown that if you play either a3 and, you know, just get the pawn this way, or even knight d2 is just very, very unpleasant for black. White basically has plus one according to the engine. So the new way of playing this gambit, and this is what I mean by being a new gambit, is this move of knight to e7, which was something that Daniel Dubov came up with and actually had some decent results with in some Blitz and Rapid games. Even Magnus Carlsen actually played this against Andrew Tang in a bullet game on Lee Chess. And yeah, the idea is that you're still going to play like kind of in a similar way to a normal Alban, the way Morozevich was playing it, you know, with G397. This was the way that Morozevich tried to revitalize this system for Black. So we're kind of just accelerating it and keeping that tension between the pawns. Is objectively a good line? Well, white, of course, is going to still be much better if he plays correctly. But if you want to surprise your opponent, this is definitely one way to do so. And if we look at the statistics in the lead chess opening explorer, well, black is scoring a 49% win rate. And when you factor in the, the draws as well, doing some quick math, that comes to about a 52% you know, score for black, which is pretty decent when you think about it to get a plus score when your opponent has the first move. Uh, the most common move is CD5, but there are other moves they can play, like Knight F3 is a move that you will also see a fair bit. And after Knight C6, like CD5 is going to lead to somewhat similar territory to the game. But if they do play a move like E3, you know, you can play Bishop to G4 here, for instance, try to you know, pin the Knight, try to get your pawn back. Uh, you could also definitely play a move like Bishop to E6, which actually scores better. The idea being you know, after CD5, you know, to Bishop is sort of supporting the queen and you're know, everyone going to get a very similar kind of ending to what you'll see where you know, maybe objectively white is still, of course, doing quite well, but you can definitely you know try to get back the pawn or try to annoy them with knight db4. So it's only a position that's sort of trickier for white than the plus one evaluation of the engine would make you think. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, do make sure to hit the red subscribe button and subscribe to the channel. The computer's top line, by the way, is to play knight c3 in this position, which I don't think it's a move you'll face all that often, but, you know, it is a move that white can play. You know, they can go knight b5 and definitely try to cause some problems for this pawn on d4. Um, in this case, I guess it's good to know that knight e to c6 is the best move, but then if they try to win the pawn, we can at least defend it. I mean, the fact you'll be able to kick their knight away here does mean I think the black position is actually quite reasonable in this case, so I wouldn't be too concerned about this. Like, the engine is recommending e3 here, but then at least, you know, you double the pawns, it's, like, somewhat playable for white, black in that case. Uh, this is probably the reason to say why the engine, after more thinking, is leaning more towards knight e4, but again, I mean, you're able to pressure this pawn, and I would not be too concerned about this. I think the move cd5 in this game is, is probably a better one. So we have queen takes d5, black gets his little bit of a lead in development, and why I really should play the move a3 here, because after knight f3, the move knight b4 is kind of annoying, where if you go knight a3, the knight is just kind of really stuck, and white's going to have a bit of a hard time developing his queen side without giving back the pawn. Well, you could say that even bishop e6, you know, hitting the hitting the a2 pawn can be of a bit of an issue in some cases. Um, so yeah, this is not really what white wants in uh, in this case. Uh, I could probably argue bishop f5 is even more precise, but okay, it's more of a minor point. So a3 is the right move, and this is what Peregaric uh, Kazori had played in this game against Christian Kopk in, I think it was a title Tuesday this is from. Uh, well, I could play the move e4, you know, it ends up kind of leading to something similar to the game anyway, but after knight f3, h6, we sort of see Black's idea that he wants to go g5, bishop g7, and try and win back the pawn. So definitely quite a, a nice, uh, creative way to play it. Um, if they try to stop it with h4, you can still go g6 and go for the same plan anyway, more or less. Of course, white's still going to be much better, but you know we're not playing this line to equalize. But to get a creative position, get the opponent thinking of their own from the very start, 
on the basis of when you're probably sinking their own early, they're probably going to make some mistakes quite soon. White should probably just develop normally with knight c3. I'm a little bit surprised that white didn't just play this in the game, to be honest. Maybe he was concerned about g5 and black getting the pawn, but the move knight b5 is quite a big problem here. And this is the reason why if I was playing it as black, I would probably just develop the bishop. You know, you could probably make an argument for all three of these moves, but bishop e6 seems to me like the most logical development. After something like bishop b5, long castles, you could get a position like this where I mean... And the double pawns aren't wonderful for black, but it's not that easy for white to attack them, I and you do have the bishop pair to compensate. Most of the time, white was just playing castles and games, and, you know, black can then go g5, knight c4, and you're actually getting pretty good compensation for the pawn when you get to a to a position like this one. And black scores 4 out of 6 in the database on Lee Chess, which is always nice. Um, actually, in this position, after bishop b3, maybe c5 is a nice little novelty, just to, you know, cut the bishop's... Uh, let's say, mobility a little bit. But, okay. It's also true that if you are worried about the double pawns, you could go bishop d7, and I personally am not a big fan of it. It looks a little bit passive to me, but it does score very well in the Lee Chess database, so, you know, it's definitely something that you could explore, like, these positions if you are so inclined. And, you know, I think black is, is only somewhat worse. For, uh, from a practical point of view, his position seems reasonably playable. Uh, of course, engine is giving plus one. You know, this is why I recommend bishop e6. But anyway, the choice is yours how you want to play it. But knight c3, I think, yeah, is the move that will give white the most advantage. Whereas after h3, which is a move I notice is being played quite a lot in blitz at different moments. Not really like they wait for g5 and then play h3, but I do feel like it's a little bit passive. And yeah, it kind of gives black what he wants. Like, I would even go g5 and, you know, play a little bit more aggressively here as black, I think. But bishop d7 is not bad either. After knight c3, long castles, bishop f4. Well, now we get in g5 with tempo. I think this is something we're pretty happy to see. Obviously, White's wanting to try to keep his pawn alive, but this is not the best sort of diagonal for the bishop, and we are going to get the pawn back sooner or later. Um, if White does try to hang on to the pawn with bishop b5, which, fine enough, is actually what was played in the game. Well, Black played rook g8, and if White does play bishop takes c6, try to keep the pawn... That would actually be a mistake, because black is A, going to get the pawn back anyway, and B, black now just has the bishop pair to go with getting the pawn back, so it's, yeah, not what the doctor ordered. Instead, white played long castles, which I think is a good move here, knight e5. White plays bishop takes d7, I think it's better to take with the, this way first. Uh, in this way, you're just sort of able to, you know, not let the black knight get to e5, and, you know, a position like this... Well, it happened in two, two games in the Lee Chess database. One, actually both fairly high-level games. Uh, my apologies, the move knight d7 was played in the games. Probably king d7 is a little bit more precise. But yeah, there were two games, actually three games played, which were like two wins and a draw for black. So that's a pretty pretty good sign for us. You know, black played f5 in one of the games, which would probably be my choice. Just, you know, wanting to liquidate a little bit and equalize reliably. But yeah, also, you know, building up position, also playing a couple of games, and, you know, also led to good results. So you can sort of see, you know, that white, even when, you know, they do get to a fine sort of position, well, you could sort of say that we do have a bit more time on the clock, thanks to the opening surprise. Uh, black played knight bd7, and again, white should probably just trade the knights, you know, knight d4 is just being a little bit too clever, I think. Knight c5, and, you know, it turns out that the d3 square is much more important than the, the f3 outpost for white. Like, for example, knight f5 is even just tactically failing, because we can just take on c3. Other times it looks weird to give up the finco bishop for the knight, but here it makes sense, because a, you're winning a pawn, and b, if they're saying no, you're not winning a pawn, well, then you go rook e2, and white is going to be crying here. It's actually mate in 5 according to computer here, funnily enough. But after knight d2, yes, yeah, c6 is played. Not quite sure why black didn't just go knight c4, and, you know, just dance with the knights at this point. Okay, you are also threatening knight takes e4 to win a pawn, so this is very bad for white, and instead black plays c6, don't ask me why, uh, and white plays king c2, you know, sort of missing a chance to, let's say, try to kick the knight away with b4, or at least try to trade off some pieces to relieve the pressure a little, but king c2, now knight c4 is a big problem, because if f3, we have a little knight e3 fork, and after rook takes d8, rook d8, white would like to challenge the d5, rook d1, and 
well, I don't really see much alternative. I think you have to challenge, but unfortunately, after Rook D1, White now has to choose which of his children to leave to die because King D1 leaves, allows Knight takes B2, and Knight D1 allows Knight E4, and either way, Black was winning a pawn and will win the end game basically. Playing H4 instead is yeah, just completely suicide. Like I don't know, maybe the guy just wanted to end the game as fast as possible, but yeah, after King C1, Knight B3. He spoilingly allowed the checkmate to appear on the board. So, a pretty inspiring game, of course. You know, when you play this gambit line with 97, you know, you have to understand that if white plays all the right moves, they do get a big advantage. But because they probably have never seen the move before and we kind of have some clear plan of, you know, knight c6, bishop e6, trade the queens, go like h6, g5, uh, bishop g7, regain the pawn. You know, basically aiming for, for this sort of position, essentially. Well, we have a clear system. White has to make a decision on every move, and when they have to make a lot of decisions using their own head, they're quite likely to get at least one of them wrong. So, at least as a surprise weapon or as a fun system in Blitz games, I think you could have quite decent results with this. So, I wish you luck, and do let me know in the comments below what you think about this Dubov Gambit with uh, the move Free Knight to E7. And I will see you guys in the next training. Until then, take care.